Hi, I'm Martha Beck. And I'm Rowan Mangan. And this is another episode of Bewildered, the podcast for people who are trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out, aren't we? We are. We try so hard. Yeah. How are you doing today at figuring it out? Uh, very dimly sighted. I have, I've I've been looking at my computer screen so much that I've gotten very nearsighted. You're just a blur to me. How are you doing? <laughs> You're just a blur to me too. But yeah, I can see you perfectly clearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that you move so fast. <laughs> but what are you actually trying to figure out in a more important way? Um, I am trying to, you know, honey, I'm always trying to figure you out one way or another. You're an Good endless luck. mystery to me in the best possible way. <laughs> um, and one of the recent things that's happened in our household is that we've been infested <gasps> with moths. There's little the moths. Moth that are um you know there's some there's obviously something in our pantry that is you know we should should be putting things in the we're airtight trying. everything and we try but maybe there's something and a little moth came out of it it's kind of a gross thing to admit actually it's like oh, it is we're infested with vermin yeah and we we yeah and so these little moths started to appear and <laughs> i haven't spoken specifically to marty about this aspect of the moths but um <laughs> so i've just noticed that when you see a moth you get enraged and i do not blame you for that at all it's it there is an enraging quality to the idea of all our blankets and clothes getting munched on mm. right that's just yeah yep. that's just math mm -hmm. so that's <laughs> not the problem the weird thing for me though is on many separate occasions and on several where I know you think I wasn't watching, I have seen you in your rage towards a little tiny moth. They're so only, only little guys. They're not like big, beautiful, you know, ladies mm -hmm. of the night. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, I didn't think my brain was going to go there with that. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Look, now you know. Um, they're not those beautiful moths. They're just little shitty little moths yeah. sorry guys you're all that's, beautiful but mm. i think that's the latin name for them though is shitty little moths yeah um so marty you see them you become enraged you don't know anyone's watching and what i have seen you do is run over in high dudgeon to the moth and i swear to god <laughs> listeners do martial arts on them yes exactly like kar karate chop and yes. kick the yes. moths I do. <laughs> what is going on in your mind when you're trying to kick a moth, a flying moth to death with, first a, of with all, a fancy karate kid move? Okay, so first of all, it's not rage. What you're seeing is deep shame and ambivalence ah. and, and trying to get the energy to overcome it because I don't want to kill anything. But right. at a certain point, I thought, I'm going to start killing these things. I can't trap them and take them outside. And I really don't like... The holes in clothes. I don't like the little grubs that appear in the food. No, no. I had enough of that growing up. Believe me. There's a whole childhood history with these moths, okay? Mm. Let me just say we were Mormon. We stored wheat in in like dustbin-sized bins um, for the yes, apocalypse. Yes, this is how Mormons get their protein. Go on. Yeah, and, and so they were, the moths were everywhere, and they were in it, and we had to eat them, and it was, okay, it was really bad. So I decided... I don't want. I don't want to kill. Uh, see, I can't even say it. I don't want to kill anything, but I'm <laughs> going to kill them. So the only way I can get past my reluctance to kill something is to go back to my martial arts training, where I realize, okay, if somebody's trying to kill me or attack me or rape me or whatever, I will fight. Like that is the line, buddy. <laughs> so when I see the moth and decide to kill it. Part of me goes, no, I can't kill another living creature. And then another part goes, hey, I'm going to, you know. I'm a bad, bonsai. I'm a badass. I'm going to take so you to down. Go back. Yeah, I have to go back into the mental state I was in when I was in martial arts fighting my dear friends who were all like twice as big as I was and men. And yeah, uh, yeah so I start kicking and punching. It's you part start of it. kicking and punching a small flying insect. How's that working for you? I'm getting a lot of exercise. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. So in my mind, I just secretly hashtag this every time I see it. 
I just hashtag it moth wars. <laughs> and I thought it was that that was short for mother wars and that you were going to give us some deep internal so thing that you're experiencing as a mother. Now you just really not really it's just you kicking moths in my yeah. in my like distractible subconscious. It's just kicking, all you kicking weirdly enough is a better way for me to hit them than punching. Right. Uh, typically, I r- knock them out of their flight path. I think just with a rush of air, I rarely actually <laughs> kill them. <laughs> All right. And this is something that we are going to explore, Martha. But okay. for okay, now, but yeah. um, tell me, what are you trying to figure out? Okay. So... <sighs> The one thing, we'll talk about this more, but I've been writing a book and it's taken virtually all my time. And one of the ways I escape is to play little games in my phone that are meant for seven-year-olds. And one of the things that does drive me into an actual rage, so I'm already ambivalent, so that's a key grounding point. Ambivalence (laughs) leads to extreme action. I'm thinking, I'm wasting my time. This is so stupid. Why do you always have to line up three things and then they explode? And they're all exactly alike. And why are they all about candy? I don't get why they're all sugar things. Um, oh, mate, you should come over to Farm Heroes where I spend my time. There's no candy inside. I tried Farm Heroes. It's way too hard for me. <laughs> it's just hard. It's just basic agriculture. Yeah. So I have. I try not to like buy more lives. That is, that is literally just throwing money into a furnace. And so I, I have my five lives a day or whatever, and I flame out. I eat through those five lives, and then it goes. The, the screen comes up and goes. Sorry. Anyway, here are your achievements, and then it lists the things I've been able to do in this stupid phone game. No offense to anybody who's making them or whatever or who loves them, <laughs> but no, that is not an achievement. When you tell me that I have achieved something. By losing a computer phone game, it just brings up all my internalized fear of failure because sure. it's a lie. I haven't yeah. achieved anything. It's patronizing too, it's isn't it? It's very patronizing and it's very deeply upsetting for me and I think I need to go back to therapy for it. Do you think that works on anyone? Like Therapy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, don't, I think the jury's still out on that, but no. Oh. Um, the, the thing of like, look what you achieve. It's a little bit like a participation award or something. I once know this guy who lost his job and then he became obsessed with showing people that he had finished the New York Times crossword puzzle every day. Oh, yeah. And he would literally carry it around and show it to people to bolster his <laughs> sense of, I don't know, efficacy. Aww. Yeah. Aww. Humans are funny beasts. Aren't they? Aren't they funny? Aren't Luckily, really we don't are. suffer from any of those sort of issues. Nah, we aren't human. We'll be right back with more Bewildered. We don't say this enough. We are so glad you're a Bewildered listener. And we're hoping you might want to go to the next level with us. By which I mean, if you rate and review the podcast, it helps new people find us. So we can keep bewildering new souls. And you know how much we love that. Ratings are very much appreciated. Obviously, the more stars you give us, the more appreciation is forthcoming. Reviews are quite simply heaven and we read everyone and exclaim over them and we just love you all. Mwah. All right, so today's topic for Bewildered, <sighs> Marty, I'm quite excited about because mm-hmm. it's something that, well, they all the, all the episodes pertain to me as much as I can make possible. <laughs> Not because, to me at all. No, just because I'm very self-centred. So we thought we would talk about burnout mm-hmm. today. And then move into kind of reset as a as a way of of counteracting burnout. So, mm-hmm. but you know, when you hear this term burnout, especially lately, I feel like people are defining it more broadly than I would. So, if we're going to talk about being burned out, mm-hmm. what what do we what do we mean today for us for our purposes today? <sighs> I'm kind of interested in all the different definitions, but um, to me, it's just it's reaching a level of exhaustion mm. because you've been. Uh, under repeated episodes of stress and you lose your ability to regulate into being sort of all put back together after stress has sort of frayed you apart. You often talk about feeling like you've been grated. Like I always say my nervous, grater. yeah, my nervous system feels like a cheese grater or sandpaper has been all over it. And that's not necessarily catastrophic, but if you 
if you never get a chance chronic. to regulate out of it yeah yeah if it just happens over and over and over and you it's like you bob to the surface you grab a breath you go back under but you don't you're not quite getting enough oxygen on ev any given breath to actually sustain life well and i think burnout is a point we reach after a certain yeah. amount of time in that state right there's mm -hmm. a point where one cannot go on <laughs> um so and and like in terms of bewildered and culture nature, I sort of think of it as, you know, um, burnout is often going to be a consequence of when your nervous system is exposed for long enough to the impact of a culture that doesn't really fit it. So there's mm. always a, um, a trying to fit and, yeah. and ultimately yeah. failing to whatever extent. Yeah. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We did not evolve to have the stressors we have right now like there is just more going on there are more bright lights shining in our eyes there are more people streaming through our consciousness it, i mean it really is bizarre to have to deal with this level of stimulation the, the odd thing to me is that so many people can do it yeah but no kidding hypothetically we could if we were in a setting that matched our nervous systems we could find that healthy level of activity and put that in every day or every hour and then get it back in the subsequent you know night or hour <laughs> we could sustain a healthy level of energy expenditure and then rest to go on indefinitely without ever reaching burnout i want to say something to you i have a oh. ring that tells me about myself tells it yeah is it does it find them is it one ring to oh, rule them all? Mm, is I it? Don't, I don't is know. It? All I know is that I really don't want to give it to anyone. Um, <laughs> no, it tells me about myself. So for in instance, I, I wear it all the time. Every now mm -hmm. and again, I take it off and charge it for a few minutes. But I wear it all the time and I wake up in the morning and you might say to me, for instance, how did you sleep? And I will say back, let me check my app and I'll let you know. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> and so my watch tells me how I... I slept. It tells me um, how <laughs> how um, if I wasn't a good girl. <laughs> we get up, we're having coffee, and I'm like, "How you doing, Rowie?" And she looks at her app, and she she turns on the app, and the app just says, "Please go back to bed, please." please Seriously, some back. days some days I open it in the morning, and it literally says, "It's gonna be okay." <laughs> And I feel really seen when it says that weirdly. But recently, is it your the precious. It is my precious. Um, recently, it's got a new feature, which is it tells me about my stress. But the funny thing is, and it's like you could talk about ambivalence to culture. I feel like this ring is the exact, not the ring itself, but whatever the thought is that goes into the ring and the app. They're like the epitome of that because now it measures stress. So um, oh. I don't know, is that like your heart rate, your body temperature i don't Maybe know it just how knows fat your you fingers are that day um <laughs> it just knows it just knows um and and it's really funny because when you go to the app and you look at your stress levels it's always like uh, it'll be like you had a low stress day but remember sometimes stress is good ah. and then it'll say you had a lot of stress today but what? that could be really good it could be good it could be good so don't just think it's bad just because it's stress, because stress is also good. So yeah, um, my ring doesn't know if stress is bad or good, and we don't even know how it's measuring it. And that's why I think it's covering its options. If finger fatness doesn't mm -hmm. accurately describe your mood, it has an out. It could be good. It could be you. It's called you stress, like good eu stress, you stress. You're just making shit up now. I don't know. Look, I went off the reservation with the whole ring thing. I just want to say rupture, repair, get tired, rest. You know, you're saying there's a natural rhythm to these things that we can have yes. Yes. without but getting the, burned out. What does the our culture say about oh, I'm, burnout? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Yes, yes. All right. Well, what does the culture say? I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't have a mouth. It can't speak. The culture... <laughs> It has a million mouths. The culture has a million mouths by Martha Beck. It's a hydra. <laughs> Cut off its mouth and other grows back. Oh, yes. Two more grow back. Yeah. yeah. Stop. No, we're going too deep. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I feel like the culture 
as we have said so many times, just wants us to be little machines of and little productivity creators, right? Mm-hmm. And and to me, what that's about when you're talking about burnout and chronic stress and all of that sort of thing is it's like do not have a context in uh-huh. which you are productive. And uh-huh. so if that's like don't have an in, an environment, don't have emotions, don't have hormones, <laughs> don't have a ring that knows you very well, don't have <laughs> – um, like it's like you must exist in this um, climate controlled isolation tank of life mm. where where it it's just just keep producing and smile and you'll be fine. So don't have yeah. context, I think is what the culture says. And if you don't have context, you can't burn out. What do you think about that? I as a think thought? that's so interesting. And you were talking earlier about not having inner or outer weather. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, and I was thinking about how so much research has been done only on, medical research is done only on men, because women have those pesky hormone cycles that make mm. the data harder to interpret. So, like breast cancer studies were always done on men, because um, you wouldn't want to figure out what estrogen does to breast cancer. Anyway, that's just an aside. But you're right. It's like don't have any fluctuations, don't have any context of any kind. And when you said weather, I was thinking about, I just read um, a book by Catherine May, one of my favorite new authors. It's called Wintering. And she makes a very good case that in actual physical winter time, wherever you are on the globe, whatever it is for you, our biology wants us to winter. It's a, mm. it's a verb, yes. And um, if you can't respond to the weather cycles, people talk about seasonal affective disorder. Would we still have severe seasonal affective, affective disorder if we allowed our bodies to winter? Or does that maybe come from trying to do summertime things when all the biological cues are saying, yeah, go hibernate? <laughs> yeah, don't don't be an animal. I mean, I wonder if sometimes that's what burnout actually is, is a failure to winter. Ooh. You know? I like that. Like, yeah. in seasonal affective disorder, we're mammals. Um, we need to lie down sometimes. But um, in the climate-controlled, fluorescent-lit cubicle world, there is no winter or summer. There is only you know, Q1 KPIs or whatever. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what any of those words mean. <laughs> I don't either. But yeah, things and things like that. HR, uh, hashtag moth wars. Uh, uh. I, I am in hibernation. I don't quite understand. May I say something about hibernation? I, I was hoping you would. I assumed you would. Okay, so this is my new life goal. Um, Catherine May talks about dormice. Dormice. I feel like because Dormouse only has one O for the door and not two, as yeah. I always assumed reading Alice in Wonderland, yeah. that it should be Dormouses. And I don't know why that is. I struggled with that just really? this moment as I was saying, I, should I say Dormouses or Doors Mice? Right. Doors Mice. I thought they were mice that lived indoors. Yes, same. You know, not it's just indoors, but inside in doors. Door. Yeah, me too. And you know, in the in the Mad Hatter's tea party in Alice in Wonderland, the dormouse lives in the sugar bowl, and they keep smacking him on the head, and then he goes back to sleep. He's yeah. always asleep. Yeah, you should Google dormouses or dormice or whatever doors mouses, because they're adorable. Maybe it's just short for adorable mice. Oh, they sleep most of the year, and the rest of the year they're just putting on weight to survive their hibernation, mm. and they become so chubby. So round and chubby that if you find one fully fed and you put the little rounding, if you poke it gently with your finger, it will dent and the dent will stay there. <laughs> so I feel that I am going to be full. If I'm fully burned out, you just poke me. If I don't dent, mm-hmm. I need to um, eat and sleep more. Marty. There you go. Yeah. I know that your love for animals is real, but I also know that you collect facts. And yes. so I feel compelled in this moment for the sake of journalistic integrity to say, have you, Martha Beck, ever poked a dormouse personally? In my heart or in physical reality? In this lifetime? I may have spent lifetimes poking dormice. 
I think if I lived in England in previous lifetimes, I would have been digging up dormice and poking them gently for years at a time. So I think your I would homework, frame the answer. I think your homework between now and the next podcast is to find a fat little dormouse and give it a little poke. See if I think you can I have dent to fly it. to England for that, but I will. Of course you will. For a dormouse, I totally would. It's the least you can do. Anyway, my point is you got to be able to winter mm. and if like all these other animals are running on these clocks where if they did not stop doing whatever they do when they're tired, they would just die. They would just plain die. And we try not to. Get fat and sleep. <laughs> That's what we're built to do. In the winter. Yeah, but like get fat and then sleep. Get fat in the summer, sleep in the winter. I like it. Mm. I'm going to do that. I like that. I so I've been good. burned out. How about you? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Have I ever been burned out in my life? When uh, when have you been burned out? So um, I always think about workplaces. This is the whole thing with KPIs and Q1 and stuff is that I was not built to do uh, the office world very well. And I mm. think it's like... <sighs> I honestly, this this sounds a little bit like I'm trying to, I don't know, but it's really just the constant small talk, like that everyone has memorised the weather and the what might happen later in the day weather-wise and what won't, and they're all so good at knowing when to bring an umbrella and when not to. And <laughs> I'm just like, if I can get there at nine, I'm winning and I have no idea from weather I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just there. And so when I first, um, I think I was about a year into my first long-term full-time job when I just, I, I hit a, I hit a wall of, I can't do five days a week indefinitely. Mm. That's not how I'm built. And I just, I fell down and I. You literally physically fell down? Because I've actually seen you do that. Yeah, like, I mean, actually, I fatigue. did. I did. Um, I fell down. I broke a rib. And then, which isn't actually, as many people will know, all that disabling. But then I took a month off for my broken rib just to lie down and watch 31 seasons of Survivor. You fell down as a result of stress from small talk about No, the I think I fell down <laughs> in order to provide. Look, it's not important, but I think I fell down in order to provide myself something. <laughs> I just have this image of you showing up at work and somebody going, yeah, brought a, brought a brolly to work today. It's going to rain later. And you're <laughs> physically collapsing yeah. and breaking a rib. <laughs> oh, my God. It's I mean, it really it was so close to coming to that. Um, and, you know, like in other jobs, like just hiding in meeting rooms and. I used Done to it. I used to be really good at like finding weird little places where you know they're sort of strange. I worked in a university for a while, two universities at different times, and there's always like weird little cul-de-sacs and stuff where you can hide. Um, so I was always finding little spaces to hide, like a dormouse, just like a just little saying. dormouse. Um, but I will say more recently on the burnout thing, I feel really aware of, and I know I talk about the mum stuff a lot it's kind of it's you've got a toddler it's dominating your entire life it really is and um what I noticed just today was that so our daughter no longer naps but we have quiet time because otherwise we would quite literally go insane so she goes into her room and she has some quiet time uh where we just lock her in her bedroom <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's and a survive like prison, and really, breathe. but yeah. with more stuffed toys. Yeah. Um, and but then I realized, like, I get notifications on our ba on my phone from our baby monitor if if there's a, a loud noise in there or excessive motion or whatever. And I was saying to Marty earlier, like, I get that ding, and my whole body goes into fight or flight, and it's like, what fresh hell is this? <laughs> yeah. What now? And it's never anything. It's probably her just, like, talking to her little stuffy, like, hello, Mr. Santa Claus. And <laughs> uh, she's really obsessed with Santa Claus. I don't want to go into it. Um, but it's like it has this huge adrenaline response for me, mm. and – because I'm supposed to be wintering, having my little winter of the day at that mm -hmm. time. And it spikes and I feel like that spike 
of adrenaline is like yeah. there's a component of that in in the larger sense of what we're yes. saying. Do you know what I mean? Like it yeah, starts I actually feeling think chronic. The spike of adrenaline and the shift into fight or flight is what um, ends up burning us out more than anything else. Like if mm. you could, if you could go do things with with a completely level um, set of hormones that never go into flight, fight or flight, maybe burnout would not happen so much. I don't know. Mm. I mean, for me, the interesting thing is that I go into fight or flight in situations where other people get energized. Mm. So people are like, come on a book tour. You'll have a meet and greet every night with a whole bunch of new friends. And <laughs> it should be really, really energizing. Do people really enjoy that? Yes. Really? Come meet new people who like you and think like you. It seems fine. It seems great. I don't know what they mean because I literally come back from something like that and I have to like lie down on a bed and shudder for an hour to like get back into my body. You literally have a trauma response to meet and greet. Yes, I do. And and things mm. like we're going to go on vacation, you'll meet a whole bunch of new people in a and no. No, new people. I love people. But that's very like n- n- not you lo- all yeah. the time. On yeah. paper. And okay, so I actually retreat and write, which is why I love writing. That's the book tour side of writing is the part that I'm actually worst How at. Ironic that yep. to punish you for retreating and doing what you love, yep. which is like hiding in a cave and writing a book, to punish you for that good deed, helping people, they send you out into they endless send- meet and greets. Guess what? You've just joined the entertainment industry. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't want to ever see anyone. But oh here's here's the thing. My my most recent book, we we traveled a lot this year. I came back. I had a whole year to write this book, but I came home from Australia, the two of us with Lila, and realized. I don't know if we mentioned that at length for a whole episode. <laughs> I had 10 weeks to write this book. And, you know, I, I, I. They, my publisher had great faith in me and I did not have great faith in myself at that time. So I said, look, guys, I'm retreating into my room. I literally bought enough bottles of iced tea to have one iced tea every day for 10 weeks without leaving my room. I have a bathroom in there and I took like nuts and things in there and I literally hibernated and I would just wake up roll over in bed, grab my laptop and start writing because I write lying down in bed because I'm such a complete loss, a wreck of a human. And I've been doing that for 10 weeks and I can no longer see anything beyond my computer screen. And I finally got burned out on the actual just hiding in a cave and writing. Yeah, she can't look at a document anymore. She doesn't mind looking at games, but she won't look at a document. It's like, oh, God, (laughs) no, hang on. Yeah, so I I hit burnout even on doing my very favorite thing because I did it a little more than I could tolerate every day for 10 weeks. Mm. (sighs) So I'm a little bit burned out right now, and I'm very excited for the solution to whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just take a break and talk about it in just a moment. So, Ro... We gotta we gotta figure this out, yeah? Yeah, we do. We've got to figure out burnout and we have this idea of reset. I just wanted to say though, like one of the weird consequences of burnout in the culture is that you know, like with me falling down watching mm-hmm. Survivor for a month at home, it's like you have to have a st- you have to find a way to explain burnout mm. to the culture because the culture doesn't allow burnout. So right. you can't say, you can't call your boss and say, I'm going to be tired for four <laughs> yeah, like I'm it's calling not, in tired. I'm calling in tired. Yeah, I'm calling in cozy. <laughs> um, <laughs> calling in so, dormouse. I remember like really not long after I met you, you gave me the um, term cultural cover story for mm-hmm, something yeah. that's like, if the if it's not fair what the culture is asking you to do, you're allowed to make up a story. <laughs> it's like the, moral one of system. the one of the, our little loopholes with um, integrity you know, with integrity. Um, but it is. I mean, it's so obviously integrity to be a right. you know. But it's. It, but I also think that it's one of those like if you don't enjoy lying, I don't enjoy lying, and so then it's like an extra layer when yeah. you have to come up with something and and misrepresent what's going on, right? I yeah. just think it's that's just not fair. 
Yeah, it's like when I quit academia and I said to the person that was trying to keep, get me to stay, I, I'm so exhausted and I hate being here so much that I'd have to go on some kind of major antidepressants um, to stay employed. And the the dean said to me, well, I'm on antidepressants, which is fine. I'm glad he was on antidepressants. But the idea is when you try to tell people what you're actually going through, they say, well, okay, medicate it, fix it. Like, that's not a that's not a reason to not do what you're supposed to do. Mm. You know, you've got to get up and get going no matter what it takes. You know, if you have to take stimulants or whatever, do it. So you end up lying to preserve your integrity of body. Yeah, and lying to preserve the culture in a weird way. Don't put cracks in the mm -hmm. culture. Yeah. Which is yeah. That's why it's always trying. To so what yeah. do we do about it? Help us. Help me, Ro. Help me. So I reckon there's got to be two things that have to happen if we're going to kind of address burnout short term, long term, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think like one is like we all got to get together and agree to just be more honest mm -hmm. gradually in in word and deed so that the culture doesn't have to be so at odds with ourselves because that yeah. lying in yeah. order to get along with the culture, that is that is eroding us on some yes. level as well. And I don't know if it's, I think it's part of the same thing and I also think it's a different thing. There's like a soul damage thing that happens there. But um, so let's gradually try and mm -hmm. move into more um, co coherence um, between what, what we're saying and what we're doing. I love that. And it makes me remember a very big party I went to. It was like the 10th anniversary of the Oprah magazine or something. It was oh a my blasting God. party. Lucky Everything you. Was you must have met so many new people. I did. I did. <laughs> so God help me, I did. But um, at a certain point, I just turned to this circle of people that I was talking with and said, I've got to go now. And <laughs> one of them is a man I admire very much, a meditation teacher, um, famous. And um, everybody was like, well, why are you going? And I tried to say, oh, because I've got something to, I've got an appointment, uh, calling someone overseas at some weird hour, whatever. But instead, I just looked at this man, I thought, I can't lie to him. And I said, I have to go because I hate this. <laughs> and he just, his whole face softened. He just went, I hate it too. <laughs> and that actually was very nourishing to, to meet him and it's the lying. I'd like to think me. that at that moment, both of you reached into your pockets and pulled out a little dormouse Tiny and just poked dormice. them at each other. I actually just reached over and prodded him on the face and the dent oh, remained. Oh, it's sweet. probably there to this day. Oh, yeah. what a lovely thought. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. Okay, um, what's the second thing? You said two things. So then I reckon... This is, I mean, and this is where we were, where we were sort of heading is this idea of a reset. Mm. Um, and like if we can engage in regular resets, like proactively, okay. we can not just deal with burnout when it happens but get ahead of it. Because oh. I think if you wait for burnout itself to like land upon you, it's going to take forever to get back to zero and you're going to, you're seriously going to need upwards of like 28 seasons of Survivor to like just <laughs> climb back to, to baseline. Um, so, That's yeah, I'm talking about like a reset is like a planned restoration of body, mind, heart, spirit, you know. It is amazing because after the years and decades I have spent thinking about this exact thing, how do I not fall victim to the culture? I When you said reset, I thought, well, once you get fully burned out, you deserve a reset. Hmm. And I think that again is a, a cultural assumption. Yes, you get to go to the, you get to fall, lie down for a while if you are well and truly exhausted. Like I yeah. used to fantasize about finishing a marathon, and then everybody would understand why I needed to take a nap. And then I did finish a marathon, and this guy wanted me to come over to his ha apartment. This is when I was in college, and I said I just ran the Boston Marathon, and he said, well, "That's okay, I can make spinach." <laughs> I was like, no, really? I think you hate people. You just know such strange ones. Oh, yeah. Comes with my life territory. Anyway, you said th this whole reset thing is you preempt the burnout, which is brilliant. Yeah, with I, spinach I and planning. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I just think 
we've got to remember that we're animals. To go back to the wintering things, mm. we're mammals. We're mammals. We're just yes. little animals, guys. Check. Fe- you folks. got nipples. Everyone listening to this has got nipples. Sorry for you birds. Oh, my God, Marty. What? I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It just seemed really inappropriate. <laughs> Your mice have nipples. Live with it. Uh, no, but it's oh. true. We are animals. We are mammals. We and it's are. Okay. Yeah. And animals, when I come to think of it, do not wait until they are fully and totally burned out to reset. That would be suicide, wouldn't it? Exactly. And I mean, we do, we will have to go about it differently from a dormouse because um, we do have a culture that we have to exist adjacent to, if not like deep inside of. You know what? I bet dormouse culture is very tolerant of this. Just saying. Yeah. There's a lot we could learn from the dormouse community. From the storied dormouse. Yeah. So, so how do we do it? All right. So I reckon, look, and this is, we can only talk about what works for us and we're weirdos. So right. it, this, what we're going to say will resonate or won't. These are just some ideas that we came up with. So for me, like it's got to begin with getting away. And that's, uh, and that's not like, you know, it can be come to Costa Rica with Ro and Marty and la la and we'll I don't know. We'll we'll walk on the beach and 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 have a culture cleanse. We actually but it, will. But we will. But it can <laughs> but also can't always do that. Yeah, and it can so it can also just look like going and into the bathroom and locking the door after you and breathing for three and a half minutes. Like you've got to find what level mm-hmm. of getaway is possible. But it, you have yeah. to get away from it because in the room with it, whatever it is. Oh, and also turn off notifications on your phone for those three and a half minutes because... And you know what? Don't play a damn computer game that's going to give you achievements and put timed (laughs) expectations on you to do things that don't matter because that that is the culture in a tiny little thing. It tells you to do things that don't matter and then say, you've achieved and and you haven't slept because you've been playing whatever whatever candy mashing thing you're doing for the (laughs) last 48 hours of hypnotic time. Yeah, that's the culture in in your hand. Don't take it yeah. on your getaway. Yeah, and be and like there has to be solitude because that's the only time when there's no culture at all is yeah. is solitude. And then, but some people are afraid of solitude because I think they do solitude without nourishment. Oh. And if you do solitude, and you are deliberately accessing what nourishes you, um, you can fill the cup, fill the well. And mm. different people are nourished by different things. Yeah, it's kind of a fun thing to think about, isn't it? Because it's like, so for me, I have this thing where after a certain point in the evening, basically after it gets dark and I'm getting ready for bed, I'm allowed to, I don't have to listen to, I listen to audiobooks all the time, but I don't have to listen to audiobooks that are nonfiction I, mm. or even like good fiction. I just It's just <laughs> crime. It's just murder, murder, murder. And that's how I reset at the end of the day. And um, we soothing. We talk about the soothing of murder. Oh my god, guy, folks! There's this in Marty's new book. There is such a funny. It's not out yet. It's not going to be out for ages. But when it does come out, there is a hilarious passage about how soothing murder is. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. But um, what's your what's your? How do you I, nourish yourself? M- murder doesn't nourish me that way. Really? Uh, oh. No, I need nonfiction. It has to be something, but it can't be too interesting. Like if it's archaeology, I will be up till dawn, just going, <laughs> "Tell me what happened next. Where did you dig next?" <laughs> Any science, I'm just like, I am in. I'll stay oh, up all night. God, so that what I go terrible. to every time, uh, every time I'm like, I'm lying there. I'm not ready to go to sleep. I think. Okay, my body isn't sleepy. I need lugubrious Buddhism. Oh my God. Lugubrious Buddhism says things like, no. So I put I put a book, an audio book, but on half speed. And they say things like, we don't run after pleasure or away from pain. Oh we sit. Okay, stop. Please stop. Is this it is not so horrific? Oh Am I not God. putting you to sleep? No, you're giving me a panic attack. Oh, well, then that probably wouldn't work for you then. No. So everyone, like we say, <laughs> find your own thing. 
Um, okay. Outdoors. Yeah. Outdoors is a big one. Oh, yeah. Right. That for you is huge. Well, for both of us, being outdoors I mean, is huge. I think that actually that's probably one of the few that are, is quite universal because it yeah. is like evolutionary or whatever. Even like nature documentaries I've read can oh, yeah. like help mental health. Even a picture of a tree or a house plant. And they've done so many studies. I just went through them for my book. There are so many things that go right in your body the moment you start connecting with the natural landscape. Mm. I'm not even going to. We could do a whole podcast on that. The research is mountainous, and yet we still don't do it. You know, like we could we could really save ourselves a lot of health care costs if we just remembered that we're animals. Animals in nature, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So I think whatever you do, whether it's a book or whether it's a dormouse or whether it's going outside. (laughs) I like to think of it in terms of body, heart, mind, soul, those four different components. I have to rest for all those components. Mm. And the most obvious one, and the one that our culture tends to um, contemptuously disdain is the body. Like Mm. just suck it up and get your head to meetings, you know? Think, that's all that matters. So for me and for clients that I've had over the years, starting with body, and doing something really obvious like shaking and then like literally shaking your hands and feet and then stretching and breathing. Every time you exhale, um, a nerve impulse goes from the right side of your brain down to slow the tempo of your heart. Oh my God, that's that, awesome because I exhale all the time. I do too, right? We're doing something We're right. This. Yeah, we are, we are this. awesome. Yeah, I mean, is it, yeah, I just thought of a weird body thing um, for me that ha- is really, really powerful. As I used to, back in Melbourne, I used to go once a week and do kirtan yoga, which is chanting. And it's just like go in a darkened room, sit there and do some, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama stuff, seriously. And yeah, like chanting, but there's like, because it's repetitive and there's like a quality to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what the, what the science or whatever of it is but I always it's definitely about the vibration uh I think is a lot to do with chanting the way that it vibrates in your body because I would come out of there and I always said that was like spiritual wasabi the way what wasabi does to your um to your to your um sinuses is what um kirtan does to my um to my soul it's soul wasabi so for me, it's um, biometrics, <laughs> getting a place that is warm, warm enough, soft enough, just bright or dim enough, um, you know, what, and light, sunlight, firelight, candlelight, a fan in a warm room, a blanket on a cold day. I mean, it's simple, simple stuff. But I also realized that touching your head is a really big calmer for me. Is that Very nourishing. Like when you dent it, the dent stays. Yeah. And one? then... The last thing I want to say is I get in my bed and I get everything, all the biometrics right. And then I roll and roll and roll. I just (laughs) roll around. I roll on the floor sometimes. I just love to roll. (laughs) Maybe I am a dormouse. Okay. So roll, roll about on your bed. Good. Rolling is very nourishing for me. Good. Good. Hmm. Okay. So I've got I've got like a, a shorthand, like a too long don't read thing. And I think it's just like if you're in doubt about how to do your reset, but you know you're getting close to burnout or you're in burnout, God forbid, th- it's an easy hack. Rest. <laughs> it's like rest like your life depends on it. Check out um, the NAP ministry on Instagram, Trisha Hersey. She's amazing. And like rest as resistance. Yeah, raw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stick it to the man. Stick Sleep it to the for man. five days. That's Seriously. what I did. After ten weeks of writing every day, all day. I mean, I really did not stop thinking about my book for ten weeks straight, without any breaks. And it seems like a real, a really sedentary occupation. And I just thought I was getting very old because I get, I got very, very tired. And then we had a break. I took a break, and before going back and doing a second draft. And I slept almost continuously for five days. And I thought, well, this is because I'm broken. But after five days, I woke up and seriously felt like I had aged backwards. I really thought I'm just 
old and tired and nothing will ever help me. I couldn't believe that I needed five full days of sleeping. That just mm. seemed impossible because I'd never been told it was possible. It's possible. You may need to sleep for five days. You may have to wait weeks before you get a chance. But if you do get a chance and you feel like it, go with it. Yes. Yeah. And and try to get ahead of burnout, I think, is so important because yeah. if we if we wait too long, it can be quite disastrous. Yeah. And, and a- we just got to remember that we're an animal. Remember you're an animal. And yeah. uh, head off burnout and stay, stay wild. We hope you're enjoying Bewildered. If you're in the USA and want to be notified when a new episode comes out, text the word WILD to 570-873-0144. We're also on Instagram. Our handle is Bewildered Podcast. You can follow us to get updates, hear funny snippets and outtakes, and chat with other fans of the show. Bewildered is produced by Scott Forster with support from the brilliant team at MBI. And remember, if you're having fun, please rate and review. And stay wild.